Hi, I'm Lee. I'm here to talk to you about NT Government tenders, why tender assessment questions are asked the way they are, and give you some insight into what the NT Government is looking for in your response. Last financial year, the NT Government received and assessed approximately 5,000 quotations and tenders, and awarded roughly 1,800 contracts with a total estimated value of $1 billion. These contracts cover almost all industry sectors from large infrastructure projects right down to small contracts worth a few thousand dollars. Over 90% of awarded contract value went to what we refer to as territory enterprises. A territory enterprise is a business operating permanently in the NT and employing territorians. These contracts provide multiple opportunities for new and established businesses to secure new work. As one of the largest buyers in the Northern Territory, the NT Government has a responsibility to have in place a value for territory procurement framework that balances its own needs to procure goods and services efficiently and effectively with the needs of industry and the broader community. In this session, I'm going to briefly explain how this framework operates. Firstly, we will briefly examine the NT Government's procurement principles and the bi-local plan. Then we'll look at the value for territory assessment process. Along the way, we'll look at a couple of specific examples of assessment questions that you may be asked and explain what information the panel will be looking for. Lastly, we'll take a look specifically at the assessment of local content. During this session, I will be assuming that you already have a basic understanding of generic tender practices and we'll be talking generically about anti government procurement processes. If you would like to find detailed information, you can find it on the NT Government's website by searching procurement rules on nt.gov.au. While this session will be focused on tendering for Northern Territory Government contracts, these principles can be applied to tendering for other types of contracts. Let's get started with understanding the Northern Territory Government's procurement principles and the bi-local plan before we dive into the assessment process. The tender process is about marketing yourself demonstrating how your experience and capabilities aligns to the needs and values of your potential customer. The needs and requirements of the NT government as they relate to contract deliverables will generally be explained in the request for tender documentation. Understanding the values of the Northern Territory government requires us to dig a little deeper into the government policies. The insight gained through this will help you tailor your tendering approach for a competitive advantage. The Northern Territory Government's procurement framework is underpinned by five principles. These principles are value for territory, ethical behaviour and fair dealing, open and effective competition, enhancing the capabilities of territory enterprises and industries, and environmental protection. Let's start by considering principles two and three, as these have significant influence over the procurement process. The application of these principles means that the information contained in your offer will be the primary resource that the NT government will use in the assessment of your offer. Your offer needs to contain all the information the NT government will need. While the NT government staff undertaking the assessment will have some knowledge of the market, you can't assume that they know about you or your capabilities, even if you have supplied to the NT government before. These principles also mean that there are strict requirements around lodging to ensure that no party or business receives an advantage by having more time in developing their response. This can mean that being only a few minutes or seconds late in submitting could result in your offer not being assessed at all. It also means that once the closing time has been reached, you will not be able to add additional information. So make sure you give yourself plenty of time to put your quote and tender together and check everything is correct before it's time to lodge. Now let's consider value for territory. The NT government defines value for territory as procurement expenditure that delivers procurement outcomes while meeting the NTG's economic, social, environmental and cultural objectives. This is closely aligned with the fourth principle of enhancing the capability of territory enterprises and industries. Considering these principles makes it clear that the NT government is interested in achieving more than just procuring supplies at the lowest possible cost. NT government procurement assessments consider the non-financial benefit of your offer as part of a balanced value for territory assessment methodology. Assessments typically consider the following criteria. Past performance, have you completed this type of work before? What is your evidence? Capacity, do you have the capacity to deliver the requirements? 
Who are your key staff that will be delivering? What facilities and equipment will you be using? Timeliness. Can you deliver the project on time? What is your work plan and what contingencies can you put in place in case things don't go as planned? Local content. What benefits will the Northern Territory see beyond the successful delivery of the project? Innovation. Do you have any innovative practices that will improve quality, reduce cost, or provide some other benefit to the project? Price. What is the whole of life cost to deliver the requirements? Are there any ongoing maintenance or support costs? Scope specific. Any other considerations not already captured? Not all criteria will be used for every procurement. The request for offer document will give you some guidance as to what criteria are being used. We will have a more detailed look at each of these criteria shortly when I discuss the value for territory assessment process. But first, it's also important to consider the bi-local plan. You have probably already heard about the Northern Territory Government's bi-local plan. The bi-local plan supports local territory businesses by maximising their opportunity to participate in government tenders and is a critical element of the NT Government's value for territory procurement framework. The primary objective of the bi-local plan is to ensure that the largest possible proportion of every dollar spent by the Northern Territory Government is retained within and delivers benefits for the territory economy and community. With an effective value for territory procurement framework in place, local content inputs such as employment, industry development, upskilling, regional and Aboriginal development can be converted into tangible, long-lasting local benefits for the territory. There are a broad range of benefits to be realised through the bi-local plan. The bi-local plan requires that all NT government procurements include a minimum 30% weighting towards the assessment of local content, providing a significant competitive advantage to local territory enterprises. There can be a lot of confusion and misinformation about what local content means. We will look at this in more detail shortly. You can find more details about how the bi-local plan benefits territory enterprises by searching bi-local plan on nt.gov.au. Now that we've looked briefly at the NT government's procurement principles and the bi-local plan, let's have a look at the value for territory assessment process. We have already discussed that the NT government uses a balanced assessment methodology that includes both price and non-price considerations, but how does this work in practice? The exact approach adopted by individual agencies can vary slightly. However, the basic concepts are the same and the outcomes are largely consistent. Today, I'll take you through the most common approach used by an NT government. In simple terms, value for territory is the sum of non-price and price factors in the assessment process. Non-price factors include considerations such as past performance, capacity, timeliness, local content, innovation, and scope specific criteria not captured elsewhere. While price is a consideration of the whole of life cost. I will explain how the scoring of these criteria works shortly, but first let me point out a couple of things. Under the bi-local plan, local content must be weighted at a minimum of 30%. This is significant and you need to consider how you maximise your competitiveness in this criteria. Secondly, the consideration of price is capped at a maximum of 30%. This means that price will never exceed the consideration of local content. And lastly, the sum of price and non-price considerations must equal 100%. Let's start with the assessment of non-price factors. All criteria will be assessed against a predetermined scoring scale for the tender process. The scoring scale will consider how your response demonstrates your understanding of the requirement and contributes to your ability to deliver the requirements. Agencies typically use a zero to 10 scale. In the example on the screen, a score of seven out of 10 would be awarded to responses that demonstrate a full understanding of the requirement and an ability to deliver to a high standard. Under this scale, a score of seven would be considered the benchmark for a good quality tender. Scores below seven indicate an increasing level of risk that the tenderer either does not fully understand the requirements or is unable to deliver the contract requirements to a high enough level. A score of less than three may occur where the tender response demonstrates a complete misunderstanding of the requirements 
or the tenderer is substantially unqualified to undertake the contract. Scores of more than seven represent a response that exceeds the agency expectations, demonstrating a complete understanding of the requirement and a clear commitment and capability to deliver to a very high level. The scale used to score local content is very similar to the one I have just described, except the language refers to your commitment to deliver local benefits. One thing that you need to remember about the assessment is that it is based primarily on the information and evidence that you provide in your tender response. Failing to provide details in your tender submission in response to the assessment criteria can result in a poor outcome in the assessment. Weighted assessment scores are calculated by multiplying the 0 to 10 score by the assessment criteria weighting. For example, if a tender response was assessed as a 7 out of 10 for past performance, and the past performance criteria is weighted at 20%, the weighted score would be 14. To get the total weighted non-price score, all the weighted scores are added together. The process of weighting scores and adding them together is usually done in an automated spreadsheet that also calculates the price score that we'll look at next. The scoring of price is a little more complicated and I won't take you through the full mathematical formula, although it is on the screen for those who may be interested in the inner workings. The formula performs what is referred to as normalization. In other words, it transforms the tender's price into a weighted score. It is important to note that only tenders being assessed are included in the calculation, as apparently high or low values will impact the operation of the formula, and are usually indications of other problems with the tender submission that would result in the tender being removed from the process. The things you need to know about this formula are, the normalization process uses the average price of tenders being assessed as its reference point. The lowest price tender being assessed will always receive the maximum possible score. For example, if price is weighted at 30%, the lowest price will receive the full 30 points. A tender price that is equal to twice the average will receive a zero score, with prices more than double the average receiving negative scores. Once the weighted score and non-price scores have been calculated, the scores are added together to give what is known as a value for territory score. The tender with the highest overall score is considered to represent the best overall value for the territory. There can be an additional step used by some agencies to undertake a normalization process on the non-price scores. However, I won't be going into that process here today. Now that you have an understanding of how the assessment process works, it's time to have a look at some specific examples of questions you may see in a tender response schedule and look at the type of information that the tender assessment panel will be looking for. Before we do this, it will be handy to recap on a few points we have covered already in this session. To ensure all tenders are treated fairly and to maintain open and effective competition, offers will be primarily assessed based on the information submitted in their tender. This means that if you want NT government to consider some specific information when they assess your offer, you need to include it in your tender. Tenders will be assessed against a predetermined scoring scale. The level of confidence the panel has in your understanding of your, and your ability to deliver the requirements will guide the scoring process. Now let's have a closer look at a selection of typical tender assessment questions in more detail. We will not have time to look at all possible assessment criteria, so I've selected a couple of examples of real questions used in tender evaluations. I will also give you some tips on the sort of information tender assessment panels will be looking for in your response. Let's start by looking at a typical question asked under the capability criteria. When assessing capability, the experience and qualifications of key staff who will be delivering the contract will often be the focus. This particular example comes from a specialist consultancy tender, but similar questions can be found in a wide range of tenders. This question asks for an overview of experience of each person in the project team, their position within the business, their CV, skills and knowledge relevant to the work being undertaken, evidence of previous work, and the approximate commitment towards a project if successful. This is an example where there are very clear and explicit instructions for the information the assessment panel will be seeking from tenderers. The key to responding to a question like this is to identify a clear and succinct way to present this information. In this case, I would recommend that respondents use short, succinct CVs for their key project team that directly addresses the information requested in the question. 
Key points the assessment panel will be looking for in your response include, are the roles and responsibilities clear? If you just put forward names and CVs, it will be difficult for the panel to know what the role they will have in delivering the project and how relevant their qualifications and experience are. Have the right amount of resources at the right levels been identified? What role did the project team have in delivering previous projects? Is there evidence to support this or are they unsubstantiated claims? What backup or contingency plans do you have if one or more of your key staff becomes unavailable? If you have identified alternate contingent resources that could step in in an emergency, provide details of these plans. Does the proposed project team possess all of the required skills and experience? How will any gaps be addressed? Will the resources be dedicated or will they step in and step out throughout the project as required? The level of information you provide will depend on the type of tender. For example, consultancy tender responses may differ to goods and services tenders. If it is not already asked in a separate assessment question, consider how referees can be used to support demonstrating the successful delivery of similar projects. Now, let's look at timeliness. When assessing timeliness, assessment panels will usually be looking for a number of things. Firstly, does the proposed work plan demonstrate a sound understanding of the steps required to deliver the requirements? Secondly, does the work plan align with the resources identified to deliver the contract? And lastly, awareness and management of risk factors that could negatively impact contract delivery. In this example, two separate questions are asked. The first focusing on the delivery time frame and milestones, and the second around risk management. Key points the assessment panel will be looking for include, what are the key milestones and deliverables? Do they demonstrate a thorough understanding of the work required to be undertaken? What assumptions are being made? Are the assumptions reasonable? Is the delivery time frame realistic or is it too optimistic or conservative? Have enough resources been identified to undertake the work? Is it clear what point input from the NT government will be required? Has adequate time been allowed for the NT government to review and respond? How will risks to the delivery schedule be managed? Are there contingency plans that can be put in place if things don't go as planned? Have contingencies been included in the critical path or will the entire project be delayed if a single deadline is missed? When assessing timeliness, assessment panels will cross-check a number of other aspects of your response, such as resourcing plans, to ensure that there is alignment and consistency. Before we look at some specific examples of local content assessment questions, let's look at what the Northern Territory Government means by local content. I mentioned earlier that local content has a minimum weighting of 30% and is about assessing what benefits the Northern Territory will see beyond the pr successful project delivery. But what sort of things constitute a benefit to the Territory? Depending on the nature of the procurement, local content relates to any or all of the following criteria. Local employment, upskilling, including apprentices, formal and informal training. Local industry participation, such as subcontractors or parts of the supply chain. Local industry development initiatives. Aboriginal development initiatives regional development initiatives. The focus of the local content assessment will be determined by the agency to align with the contract requirements and to maximise the benefits that can be realised by the Territory. For lower value or shorter term contracts, say 10 or 12 weeks, agencies are encouraged to focus on demonstrated ongoing commitment of tenderers to improve the Territory through their everyday business activity. For longer term contracts, or where the scale of the project allows, agencies are encouraged to focus on commitments to deliver local benefits through the delivery of the contract. If you are awarded a contract, your response to the local content question forms what is known as a local benefit commitment. Local benefit commitments are a deliverable part of the contract that will be managed. Now, let's look at a couple of questions you may be asked to respond to. Let's start with one of the most common local content assessment questions. Where are the business premises and staff that will deliver the contract located? Using local facilities and people helps reduce supply chain risk during the delivery of the contract and can help ensure that local communities see tangible benefits from government expenditure in their region. When responding to questions about the location of business premises and staffing, it can be beneficial to include all NT-based facilities and staff as this helps paint a more complete picture of your footprint in the Territory. 
just be sure to clearly identify which ones will be used to directly deliver the contract. Key points the assessment panel will be looking for in your response include, what premises will be used to deliver the contract requirements? And what is the proximity to the area where the works or services will be delivered? Where are staff delivering the contract based? What other facilities and staff will be used to support the delivery of the contract through activities such as administrative support or similar? Next, let's look at a question relating to proposed subcontractors and suppliers. Almost all contracts will include at least some component that will be sourced or delivered by a subcontractor. These arrangements can have a significant impact on the amount of benefit the Territory will realise through the contract. In this example, tenderers are asked to detail all proposed subcontractors and suppliers, including if they are a Territory enterprise or not. A Territory enterprise is defined as one that is operating in the NT, has a permanent presence in the NT, and employs Territorians. The use of Territory enterprises in the supply chain ensures that there are opportunities for local industry growth. Remember to consider where you support territory enterprises as suppliers in your everyday business when preparing your response. Key points that the assessment panel will be looking for in your response include, what proportion of the contract value will be outsourced to suppliers or subcontractors? To what extent will territory enterprises be utilised as suppliers and subcontractors? Does the tenderer support by local principles in their everyday business? Assessment of the proposed subcontractor arrangements will take place alongside the assessment of your internal resourcing commitments to ensure that both approaches are treated equally. Remember that your answers to these questions will form part of your buy local commitments under the contract. While the assessment of local content will often focus on business related activities such as employment and, contra and subcontracting, the NT government does recognise the benefits of supporting local community organisations. In this example, tenderers are asked to describe how their community involvement benefits the Northern Territory. Key points that the assessment panel will be looking for in your response include, do tenderers support local community organisations? What is the nature of the support? For example, are tenderers leveraging their business capabilities through pro bono or in-kind support? Lastly, Let's have a look at a question relating to Aboriginal participation in government contracts. Questions relating to staffing and subcontractors will often include a request to specifically identify Aboriginal employment and the use of Aboriginal business enterprises as subcontractors. These questions are reasonably straightforward to respond to. The example that I have chosen for this session is somewhat different as it directly focuses on the role industry can have in addressing broader community issues. The question asks for details of any steps taken to increase Aboriginal participation in your industry. Focusing the question this way acknowledges tenderers who adopt by local type policies and practices into their own business. In preparing your response, think about how you support the principles of the by local plan in your business. Key points the assessment panel will be looking for in your response include have tenderers taken any proactive action to increase Aboriginal participation in their industry? Is the action achievable? How is the action evidenced? Every tender is an opportunity to get feedback on how you can improve. Once the tendering process has been completed and you have been notified of the outcome, you can ask for a debrief. A debrief will provide you insight into the strengths and weaknesses of your offer as assessed by the Northern Territory Government Assessment Panel. You can use this information to improve future submissions and improve your overall competitiveness. During the debrief, the agency will detail areas of strength in your offer that were viewed favourably. Identify areas of your submission that could have been improved or failed to meet the NT government's expectations. Offer you an opportunity to provide feedback of your own. Are there any ways the Northern Territory government could improve? The debrief will only discuss the assessment of your offer. No detail of any other offers will be discussed except for providing you the name of the successful tenderer and the estimated contract award value. If you have specific questions you would like to ask the debrief panel or a particular aspect of your offer that you'd like feedback on, it is best to inform the agency re when requesting the debrief. This will ensure that the agency has the information available during the debrief. After the debrief is completed, the agency will make a record of the meeting and provide you a copy. This concludes our session on demystifying government tenders. 
Before I leave you, I'd like to just recap a few key takeaways. Remember, tendering is about providing a competitive offer and marketing your business. Considering the NT government's procurement principles will help you understand what is important to the Northern Territory government. Read the tender documents and respond to all evaluation questions, even if you think they are not relevant. Be sure to include all information that you want the tender assessment panel to consider when assessing your offer. Don't assume that we know your business or you. And lastly, feedback is critical to improving. Ask for a debrief. Thank you for watching.